Green. Um, thank you so much for joining us today on this important presentation on fostering a healthy relationship with food and with body, uh, evidence-based results and recommendations for parents to help prevent eating disorders in children and adolescents. Uh, so before we start, I just wanted to mention um, that we'll be presenting in English. However, both um, Mahka and I speak French. So if you have any questions at the end of the presentation that you'd like to ask, uh, please feel free to do so. And, um, and yeah, we'll be happy to answer in whichever language is, uh, makes most, most sense to you. Um, so I'll start off by presenting myself. Uh, so I'm Dr. Melissa Arias. I'm a clinical psychologist and I work at the Ottawa River Psychology Group, which is um, a, a private clinic um, that uh, specializes in third wave psychotherapy approaches. And I work mostly with people who struggle with eating disorders, with disordered eating, as well as um, body image concerns. So I work with adults, I work with um, adolescents, as well as their families. Okay. All right. And hi, everyone. Really happy that you are here and listening to this presentation. So my name is Maria Petrzurio. Half French, half Italian, so <laughs> big name. Um, but I'm a registered dietitian here in Ottawa, Canada, um, and I'm the founder of The Balance Practice. So The Balance Practice is a private practice where we're a team of dietitians and therapists here to support um, kids, teens, and adults in eating disorder recovery. So really happy that you are here today. So in this presentation, we've decided to separate it in three parts. So the first part will really address like what is an eating disorder, the impact of eating disorder, and how do we treat it? We also added a part on COVID-19 because we do know that this pandemic has impacted the prevalence of eating disorder in the youth. Then the second part, we're going to turn into the red flags of eating disorders and how to prevent eating disorders and early interve interventions that we can do and your role as parents and caregivers. And lastly, we're going to talk about when it's time to seek more help. So when it's maybe outside of your parental role and when we need to look for more support to help your, your child. So part one is understanding our, the eating disorders. Um, so, all right, so we'll start with a brief definition here of what are eating disorders. So it's a feeding and eating disorders are characterized by a persistent disturbance of eating or eating related behaviors that result in the altered consumption or absorption of food that significantly impairs physical health and psychological functioning. So basically <laughs> what we're talking about is uh, the way that we eat our eating patterns are disturbed. So it impacts our eating behaviors, which will then impact literally everything else in our life. So our physical health, as well as our mental health. It's estimated right now in Canada that there's approximately like 1 million Canadians that are struggling with ED. And we know that that stack is probably, it's a, probably a lot higher than that. Um, the truth is with eating disorder, there's still a lot of stigma around it. Um, so the stats give us an idea, but we would presume that there's probably more um, people that are struggling with eating disorders. Um, and also maybe just to mention um, that the incidence of eating disorders in Canadian children is estimated to be two to four times greater than type two diabetes. So as we can see, this is a really, um, really important and prevalent issue that unfortunately does not get a lot of attention. Okay, so there's different types of eating disorders. Um, so I'll just kind of like go through them a little bit briefly. Um, so uh, anorexia nervosa is uh, probably the one that you're most familiar with. It's marked by um, significant eating restrictions that lead to significantly low body weight, which means um, that it's less than minimally normal or minimally expected um, in relation to uh, the age, the sex, the developmental trajectory, as well as physical health of the person. Um, it's also marked by an intense fear of gaining weight or of becoming fat or persistent behaviors that interfere with weight gain and a disturbance in the way that the person um, views their, their body weight and their shape and how they, they kind of experience being in their body. Uh, bulimia nervosa is marked by um, recurrent episodes of binge eating. So it's episodes where the person eats 
a large amount of food in a short amount of time and experiences a sense of loss of control over the eating, as well as recurrent compensatory behaviors to try to prevent weight gain, such as uh, self-induced vomiting, use of laxatives, fasting, over-exercising. And here, uh, again, the evaluation of the self is influenced by um, how they view their body and their shape. Uh, binge eating disorder is uh, basically the presence of um, binges um, without the presence of compensatory behaviors necessarily. So eating large amounts of the food in a short amount of time. Uh, and we've got avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, which is um, actually a, a newer diagnosis um, that is marked by uh, an intense sense of distress associated with eating certain types of food and eating restrictions as well. However, the fear, um, the fear is not associated with weight gain necessarily, but mostly associated with um, the, the texture of the food. Um, so the, the fear is a little bit different. However, it does lead to significant weight loss and it can be um, very damaging. We've got other specified feeding and eating disorders, uh, which are, are the presence of uh, some of the main symptoms of the three first types of um, disorders that I, I talked about, however, missing one or two symptoms, for instance, atypical anorexia, purging disorder without the presence of binging and for bulimia. And then we've got unspecified eating disorders, which involve um, a combination of different types of symptoms without having a, a kind of like one of the clear diagnoses that I talked about at the beginning. Uh, we also have some disorders that are a little more rare. So for instance, we've got PICA, which is a compulsive need to eat non-food items such as dirt, clay, etc. and rumination disorder, uh, which is um, when the food is brought back from the stomach and rechewed. Um, so these two disorders are, are pretty rare. And for the purpose of the presentation, we won't spend too, too much time on them. Um, and then we also have other types of um, kind of diagnosis that uh, are not present in the DSM um, itself, but that more and more in the literature we're paying more attention to because um, they, they do become uh, significantly damaging. So we've got orthorexia, which is uh, an obsession with uh, eating foods that are healthy. And we've got bigorexia, which is um, more of um, a, um, an association or, or wanting to um, put on weight to be bigger. That's one obsession mostly with uh, muscles and changing eating behaviors in order to gain muscle mass. Yeah. And we wanted to add this slide here to talk about eating disorder versus disordered eating. Because as you can imagine, an eating disorder does not appear out of nowhere. Typically, our eating patterns are on a spectrum. So if we look here to um, the first stage would be like the normal quote unquote eating, which is the intuitive eating part, right? We're not too concerned about food. We allow food to have pleasure. Food is nourishment. We're more at peace around our body. Um, and food, food is just food when we're here. This is the ideal place of where we want to get to. And then when we go all the way to the other side of the spectrum, this is where we have a, an eating disorder that meets DSM criteria. But in between that, we have different ways that our eating behaviors can shift and change and sometimes become disordered without necessarily having the diagnosis of being an eating disorder. And this was important for us to mention because when we will talk about risk factors and red flags, often, or not risk factors, just red flags and things to look out for, um, we're probably gonna be looking at signs of disordered eating, which is typically um, signs before we see the eating disorder. So there are gonna be things that we're gonna be looking at a little bit more closely in terms of where we fall on this spectrum and when would be a good time to get help. Okay, so we wanted to share a few myths. So the first one is, you can't have an eating disorder unless you're extremely thin. So the reality is that many people who suffer with eating disorders are not thin or underweight and actually sometimes can even live in larger bodies. Uh, regardless, eating disorders are dangerous no matter the size of the person and no matter if they look healthy or not. Um, another myth is that eating disorder are just a phase and they tend to go away on their own. And unfortunately, this is not the case. Eating disorders are not a phase. They are serious mental health illness that do require support and care 
to be able to recover from the eating disorder. We also hear a lot like, oh, eating disorder is rare because we don't hear about them that often. But again, the truth is that that's not the case. They are very prevalent in our society and even more so today. And again, like that stat in 2016 saying that there's at least 1 million Canadians that do suffer with an eating disorder that we probably are lowballing it <laughs> in that sense. And uh, another one is eating disorders are just a way to get attention or to be thin. Actually, what, what the research shows us is that they're not a lifestyle or a choice um, and that it's not about receiving vanity, receiving attention, but it's really a serious, pervasive mental illness that requires professional attention. Um, so let's talk about risk factors here for a second. So there's lots of different things that can um, kind of like predispose a person to struggle with an eating disorder. And we'll start with um, genetics. So family studies of people who um, experience anorexia or bulimia actually have found that there's a higher prevalence of eating disorders for those who have relatives for eating disorders as well. Um, also, what we notice is that um, there's, there's estimates that um, the additive genetic effects can account for a large percentage of the variance in terms of the development of an eating disorder and disordered eating. So genetic component is very important, actually, and, and the predisposition to develop an eating disorder. Um, we also wanted to talk about the environment, which we feel is very crucial as well, um, especially what we see in the media. So media images, uh, on one end can simultaneously reflect and transmit social norms and stereotypes of bodies, such as weight, uh, weight ideals, appearances, standards, and gender expressions. And a meta-analysis, which are studies that basically regroup a whole bunch of other studies that have been published out there um, and analyze the results together. Um, have, or the, the effects together, um, have shown that uh, media consumption can impact body image and increase internalization of thin ideals. Um, so this is something that's uh, really important. Another um, factor of the environment that can be um, an important risk factor as well is that if the environment encourages dieting. Uh, so what we find is, um, well, dieting is a, a um, problem type of behavior that we call a disordered eating as well that can predict um, eating disorder development. And what we actually find is that in Canada, about 12 to 30% of girls and 9 to 25% of boys between the ages of 10 and 14 report dieting to try to lose weight. Um, so this is something that's, that's definitely pretty alarming and that can uh, predispose a person to struggle with an eating disorder. And finally, we wanted to talk about family dynamics. So what we find is that um, families in, when, in which there's unfavorable and strict family rules, especially with regards to eating, um, as well as pressures regarding the body and physical form can also predispose a person to struggle with an eating disorder, but of course it's not the only factor. Yeah, and the way that we like to explain it is that eating disorders are multi-layer, like an onion, there's so many layers to it. There's typically not just one thing that will cause an eating disorder. It's typically a combination of all these different risk factors. So we wrote a list here of how these three risk factors kind of like show up in different ways for different people. Um, so I'm not gonna go through the whole list because there's a lot of different things, but just really understanding that there's typically just not one thing that will cause the eating disorder. It's typically a series of yeah, different um, risk factors that add up together. So historically, eating disorders have been blamed on parents. However, the current state of research suggests otherwise that as my fan mentioned, there's lots and lots of different factors that are involved in the, in the development of an eating disorder. And in fact, there's many studies that show us that Family involvement is useful and we think crucial in both preventing and in reducing eating disorder symptoms, especially for younger clients um, who, who might experience a shorter duration of the eating disorder. So we think parents are not the cause of the eating disorder, but are crucial for prevention. 
All right, so now let's talk a little bit about the impacts of eating disorders. So we'll talk about the adolescent first and then through family and society. Um, so when we think of the adolescent, uh, we know that untreated eating disorders have important implications of the physical and mental health. Right. Um, when we try to picture it, I know if you haven't struggled with eating disorder, don't work with eating disorder, sometimes it's hard to understand and there's a disconnect. But if we can think about like the eating disorder being like a presence that's always there, like I imagine it as being a little like a little person on the side, on their shoulders, always constantly yelling in their ear, telling them what they're eating is not good, telling them their body is not good. And it's constantly there. So we can imagine that if that's the case, every area of their life is impacted. It's hard to connect, it's hard to concentrate, it's hard to really be themselves, right? A lot will um, refer this as like, almost like their own personality is being dimmed when the eating disorder shows up because it takes such a big space. So we also know that in Canada, eating disorders have the highest overall mortality rate of any mental illness and is estimated between 10 and 15%. So again, the severity of this chronic illness is extremely important to, to understand. And we also know that suicide is the second leading cause of death after cardiac disease among, among those who have anorexia nervosa. 20% um, of people with anorexia nervosa and 25 to 35% of people with bulimia may attempt suicide in their lifetime. So again, extremely impactful for the person who is struggling with the eating disorders. And for female age 15 to 24 years old, the mortality rate associated with anorexia nervosa is 12 times higher than that of all other causes of death combined. Again, extremely impactful in terms of the person who's struggling with the eating disorder. Do you do family or do you want me to do family? <laughs> Sorry, I thought, um, I thought that was you. Um, but I can go ahead as well. Okay. Um, <laughs> so the, the, um, the impact on the family is also really important. So what we find is that eating disorders, um, th there are several studies that show us that um, family members that are caring for a person with an eating disorder will experience in general a lot of distress, a lot of anxiety, and a diminished quality of life. Um, so when a person in the family struggles with an eating disorder, basically the whole family is impacted. And uh, there's also some societal costs that can be associated with, um, or important um, societal costs that are associated with eating disorders. Um, so currently, um, treatment is, is uh, not covered by OHIP. Um, and in 2015, there's a study that showed us that inpatient costs um, in Ontario specifically uh, was of, of about $54,932 per admission, um, which is for a mean stay of about 37 days. So we got this graph, um, it, it's from a study done in 2018, 2019 on the, or 2018 in the US. So we do realize that the numbers are probably a little bit more inflated in terms of like currency. However, this shows us a really nice image of how much um, eating disorders can impact, impact our economy and our society, right? So we look at the different breakdowns of how, you know, it causes like the productivity loss or the efficiently loss or every family and individuals, if you have to pay out of pocket for, for support or just the government itself as well. So we do see here in terms of like the impact on our economy and the cost of care is pretty significant when we think of the chronicity of the eating disorders themselves. Uh, so when it comes to treatment, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence um, has published some guidelines for eating disorder treatment. For children and adolescents, the typical um, types of interventions that are recommended include family-based therapy, as well as enhanced cognitive behavioral therapy for eating disorders. Um, however, it's important to note that the recommended treatment interventions typically reach significant clinical improvements in about 50 to 75% of patients. And among adults, more specifically, these um, chronic conditions and relapses are, are common, even after the completion of a successful treatment. So given the severity, the length, the difficulty to treat, 
um, when the eating disorder has been consolidated and present for many years, prevention becomes extremely important. All right, and we wanted to add this slide again on the impact of COVID-19 um, in terms of the prevalence of eating disorder and more specifically in the teens, um, the adolescents. So COVID-19 has been this like perfect storm that allowed a lot of um, people for the eating disorders to, to become more prevalent. So there's a few in areas in which we saw that it really impacted that increase in eating disorders. The first one is the routine and lifestyle. So COVID-19 impacted most of us in terms of a routine, right? The life we had a year ago or a year and some ago is very different from the life we have now. Um, for teens especially, like being able to go to school and to see friends was such a really important part of their development. Like if that has been taken away, their routine completely changed. This impacted them in terms of like, as did I think most of us in terms of like the control that we feel over our life. So what we saw is like with those routine changes and not having control, the eating disorder came to kind of like fill that role, right? When life feels out of control, hyper-focusing on food in your body kind of gives us that sense of control um, that we may be looking for. We also know that our lifestyle might have changed, right? Our eating routines, our activity routines might have been completely different. And sometimes those lead to our bodies changing. And body changes can create body discomfort. So if your body has changed, if you've gained weight, and then we'll talk about the, the time on social media, but if you have gained weight, um, that can create a lot of discomfort that you try to then change, right? You try to look at your at your food and what you can do. And maybe you start dieting, which again is a big predictor of developing an eating disorder. So that's the first way that COVID really impacted our teens. The second way is increased time spent on social media. We've seen in the last year that people are spending a lot more time on social media, um, especially outlets like TikToks and Instagram, which often have time have a lot of misinformation about nutrition, but also a lot of, um, a lot of pictures and videos around this thin body, right? So the idealization again of the thin body and what a thin body should look like. Um, and this in itself, like the impact of social media is really, um, yeah, it's, re it's really important to understand in terms of our, of our teen, right? Because this is the content that we consume. So especially at the beginning of the pandemic and honestly, probably now too, um, the COVID-15 and the scarcity around like, oh, if your body changes, like it's no longer good um, is really impactful in terms of the way we internalize that and view ourselves. Um, and then the third way that COVID has impacted is health concerns. So we're in the middle of the pandemic um, and you know some people some people are dying and it, this is a really um, important disease obviously right we're all home or everything has changed and the fear for our health led a lot of people to want to start dieting or want to start hyper focusing on their nutrition and again a lot of this comes from the impact of social media telling us about all these fad diets that we should do for our health um, but when we have a self concern, a health concern or a body starts to feel unsafe or we're scared for our safety um, and health, that's a big driver for us to want to change. So we saw a lot of teens starting to want to diet in order to protect their health. And then again, dieting is a big predictor in terms of developing an eating disorder. All right, so now we're going to get into our part two, talking about prevention and early intervention. So I think the first part of prevention is really being aware of the red flags. Um, as parents, you probably spend a lot of time, you know, with your kids, so you get to see a lot of these types of behaviors. So there are a lot of different red flags, and this is where when we saw that, like, um, continuum of eating, this is where we get more into that, that disordered eating space. So it's not yet maybe like a full-out eating disorders, but there are some little things in your child's eating patterns or the way they feel about their body that may indicate to us that there's something happening. So the first one that we look at is weight fluctuation. Um, and this, I want to say with a, um, a little warning sign, because some people who have eating disorders 
their body don't change, right? Their body stays exactly the same. So weight is not the sole indicator of someone struggling with an eating disorder, but it can definitely be an indicator. So if you've seen that your child has lost a lot of weight very fast, has gained a lot of weight really fast, or you see a fluctuation up and down through time, that can be an indication that there's something happening in terms of their eating patterns. The second one is really around their body. So distorted body image or body satisfaction. So we see this with um, children or teenagers who start talking a lot about their body and express a lot of concern around their body and how they appear. We can even see that through um, not wanting to go to social events, not wanting to be seen on camera during their classes, um, hiding and wearing very baggy clothes to try to hide their body. Those are all signs that there may be some body dissatisfaction there too. We may also see some chaotic eating and skipping meals. So not wanting to eat with the family anymore, skipping breakfast, skipping lunch. Um, it can even be like trying to hide their, their eating. So I'm going to eat in my room and you're not actually seeing your child eat. Um, and it could be chaotic eating too, of like eating different things at different times and then maybe not actually having meals, but more like having different types of snacks. Um, we can also see that in terms of like, if we find our kid like being concerned about calories, concerned about the portions that they're eating or wanting to, to decrease the portion that they're eating. And um, we also see the desire to need alone or in secret. So if, if your child no longer wants to eat with the family or you find them wanting to eat in their bedroom, or it could even be if you're starting to feel like there's foods disappearing in the home, right? So we're finding wrappers, we're finding different things in the house um, telling us that maybe, you know, food is gone or your child has like eaten in like in a secret. And um, that's also a, um, a big red flag. Again, obsession with her physical appearance and the need to change it. Um, and this can also sh like be shown with like wanting to do more exercise, right? If we become more obsessive around exercise, having to move all the time, we can also see some children like pacing. So walking around the house, becoming very antsy if we're having to sit down for a long period of time. Um, using the bathroom or shower frequently after meals can be a really big red flag. Through that, we also have like if there's um, any types of cuts on their knuckles um, or if you see discoloration in their teeth or puffiness in their face. So this can be really red flags that we may be engaging in purging behaviors. Persistent worry or complaining about being fat or talk of losing weight. So when we start talking about really like the fatness and being scared of like um, being fat, gaining weight, maybe looking at people in larger bodies and like being very judgmental towards it. And like a lot of talks about losing weight or asking questions about dieting, asking questions about weight loss. We can also see this through their social media feed if that's something you have access to. Like what type of content are they looking at? Are they looking for weight loss? Are they looking at fitness models or ways to reduce fats? Like all of these things would be um, red flags to take into consideration. Um, and then feeling a lot of guilt and shame and disgust around eating food. So if meal times because becomes an anxious times, becomes a times where your child may find, uh, may be very antsy, again, very, a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress, there may be a lot of guilt and shame. Maybe if you see that their favorite foods, they don't want to eat anymore, or they're becoming obsessed with the healthy eating and just eating foods that they deem appropriate. Um, so we see a lot in the language that they use around food too. So when we see that changing, um, those are red flags to take into account as well. All right. So now that we've talked about the red flags, we've talked about the risk factors, uh, let's talk about some protective factors, right? Um, so having high self-esteem, having um, practicing body acceptance, uh, having an ability to critically process media, having emotional awareness, um, having abilities to solve problems, to have good coping skills, abilities to uh, be assertive, uh, belonging to a family that doesn't overemphasize weight or physical attractiveness, eating regular meals with the family, and belonging to groups of people that don't overemphasize weight or uh, physical attractiveness, whether it's in school, in sports, or in peer groups, can be extremely protective factors. And uh, the interventions that we're going to talk about today really capitalize on these protective factors. Um, so families and research. So let's talk a little bit about how parents can be special in terms of um, helping to prevent. So of course, there's lots of research in different areas, but how are parents spe uh, spe special 
um, more than anything. So one of the first things that makes parents special is um, their ability to take charge um, and to remove a lot of the anxiety that the child might be experiencing. Parents are really unique in terms of, um, parents' role in terms of this can be extremely important. Um, whether it's you know, monitoring food, whether it's monitoring um, social media context, um, parents can play an, a really important role on that aspect. Uh, another thing that's really unique about parents is um, that they can have some unique insights in terms of their child's experiences. Um, you live at home with them, you get to see them, you get to monitor them. Um, so your experiences can be extremely helpful also in terms of um, helping to prevent. And finally, another aspect in which parents can be extremely important is by modeling healthy relationships with food and body. Um, so there's lots of research that has shown us that modeling uh, can be extremely important for both parents and uh, for the children and for the parents as well. Yeah. And we, we like to empower parents through this, through the prevention, because like Melissa said, like there's so many areas in which parents can be so supportive and helpful to their child. And we support and we um, recommend an overall attitude in terms of like we have a, the four C's that we'll talk about in terms of how for the next few slides when we're going to talk about things that we can do, ways that we can start like embody this attitude. So when we think of prevention and your role, there's four different ways that we want to do so when we're um, talking about these different principles. So the first one, the first C is remaining calm. If you're thinking that your child may, you know, have disordered eating or may have um, eating disorder, it may be very terrifying for you. It may be create a lot of fear and we totally understand that. But remaining calm um, will support your child with maybe their anxiety, right? Because they pick up on that when we start getting agitated. So remaining calm as much as we can when we notice these behaviors. The second one is being confident. And this is where we're here to empower you and being confident in what you're going to do and the interventions that we take, right? The more confident you appear to your child, the more they're going to be reassured that you got them, right? And you can support them through this. The third way is that we want to be consistent. Um, and this will apply a little bit more once uh, if we need to put any type of interventions in terms of um, like food or body image, but we want to be consistent in our approach um, and with the messaging that we have, right? Um, when we start seeing that our child may have some types of eating disorders, we may find our child wanting to negotiate with us, especially around food of what they want, what they don't want. And this is where we just need to be consistent in our approach. And the last piece is just being compassionate. And this is also really important, right? Going back to the myths around eating disorders, the child did not choose to have an eating disorder. It's not a choice. It's not about vanity. It's not a phase. It's something that they are going through that is really painful and hard. So showing your, your child compassion and understand that what they're going through, it's probably really terrifying for them too. Um, and your compassion can really, really support them through um, this hard time as well. Right, so today we'll be presenting four different types of strategies um, that you can use to um, support your kids and help prevent eating disorders. One is creating a nutritionally and movement safe home. Second is developing media literacy. Three is body appreciation and gratitude. And four is parental self-awareness and modeling. All right, so we are going to start with creating a nutritionally nutritionally and movement safe home. And you may be wondering like, okay, I don't, I'm not sure what this means. And that's okay, we're gonna explain it. So when we talk of having a nutritionally and movement safe home, it's being in a place where we feel safe around our relationship to food and our relationship to movement without any shame, judgment or guilt around it. So ways that we can do this, well, the first part is really understanding diet culture. And if you don't know what diet culture is, I'm going to explain it very fast because I was telling Melissa, I can talk about this for a really long time. So I'm going to try to keep it short. When we think of diet culture, it's really everything that has to do around dieting, right? This idea that we need to change our body, this idea that we need to, um, you know, that some foods are good, that some foods are get bad, that like the thin eye body is the better body, that to be healthy, we need to be thin. So all these core beliefs that we may have around our own relationship to food and our own 
um, body image, those are things that we need to take into account and understand, right? Understand like, okay, why do we think that we need to lose weight? And how is my child maybe internalizing those messages? We want to make sure that we are not dieting around loved ones. And I know this part is hard, right? Because I mean, we all live in diet culture and we may all have, um, you know, your, maybe your relationship to food and your body is not exactly where you want it to be. And we're often sold the idea that dieting is the way to go. Um, but this is really, really important because going back to, again, kids model us, right? So making sure that we are not dieting um, or that they are not aware that we're dieting. So really being careful with that. So this can also be that we're not, um, having diet foods in the house, right? That we're not talking again about food being good versus bad. Of like, if I eat this, this is good. If I eat that, that is bad. Especially making assumptions about ourselves. Like, oh no, like mom ate ice cream last night. Like, oh, I'm so bad. Like this morning I need to eat, I don't know, this food to make up for it. So these types of comments and the way that we view food, we really need to be aware of it to be able to have this space where like food is just safe, right? So there's no good food, there's no bad food. We're not taking it away that there's food that are very nutritious, there's food that are less nutritious and that's fine, but food itself has no moral value. And we really want to share that message with our kids. We need to make sure in our homes that all foods fit, right? That there's no foods that are like off limit that you can't have that are like the bad foods or that are only like for those special times that it's okay that all of these foods fit, right? Like carbs are good, fats are good, proteins are good. We need everything to come into our nutrition. The more that we allow foods to fit, the less I will have necessarily cravings for these foods or this like want, this extreme urge to have these foods because we know that it's there for us and we have this unconditional permission to eat. And this in itself is really, really important for kids to also feel safe around that food and that you know food security. They're like, oh, all of it is available to me and I get to choose. We also want to cultivate and reinforce the respect around bodies, right? Your body, your children's body, other people's bodies. So regardless of weight that we're really working towards that all bodies are good bodies, right? And that our bodies themselves do not create our worth. So learning all that we can about weight biases and discrimination, right? How, how does that impact us, right? The way like if you've, if you live in a larger body um, and you've been discriminated against or, you know, at the doctors or whatever the case may be, like, how does that actually impact us? And there's a lot of implication, right? When our body again starts feeling unsafe because of its size. So really making sure that we are watching our language around bodies and that we're educating ourselves too, right? And this benefits your kid, benefits you too, in terms of like making peace with that body. And then the same thing will apply with movement. Like how are we talking about movement? Is movement something we need to do to compensate or to earn food? Or is this something that's joyful that we do because it's kind to our body and our body loves to move? So really making sure that we're not, again, placing so much value on exercise and that exercise is something that needs to be done or like we are active people and like we don't want to be lazy. Like really, really making sure that we're, we're tuning in with our language around food, around bodies and around movement. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about media literacy. So mass media exposure is inescapable these days. Uh, so on average, children and adolescents will spend about 53 hours a week on entertainment media. Um, and with, as my parent has had mentioned, with COVID-19, there's been an increase in media use. So it's really, really important for children as, and adolescents with the help of their parents to start developing some resistance and some resilience to some of the messages um, by becoming more active in terms of how they choose to consume media, as well as the internalized messages that might be present in media as well. So media literacy is the ability to access, to analyze, to evaluate, create, and act um, using all forms of communication. And, um, once again, a meta-analysis of 112 studies have now shown us that media literacy interventions are um, significantly help reduce shape and weight concerns in both um, boys and in women, uh, which, as we know, is an important risk factor in the development of eating disorders. So parents can become um, really, really important in terms of contributing um, to Help, develop, help their children develop media literacy skills. 
Um, so some ideas in terms of what can be done is uh, one to monitor media cons uh, that's consumed, to ask questions and to actively participate in mass media consumption, as well as to encourage them to see uh, what is seen and what isn't seen in mass media as well. So I, I added some examples of some discussion questions that could be present to have with, uh, with children as well as with teens. So with a child, for instance, looking at uh, action figures uh, or looking at dolls, we can ask questions like, is this doll supposed to um, be, look like an adult? Do all the women in your life look like this doll? If not, how are they different? Uh, in this TV show, who's the good person? Who's the bad person? Why? Um, what character, or like this, in this TV show, this character is supposed to be 14 years old. Does this person, does the character look like any 14 year olds you know? If not, why not? So just kind of um, developing some curiosity um, and helping children develop a, a kind of curiosity in terms of what they're consuming as well. With uh, teens and with adults, we can ask questions more specifically linked to uh, social media. So for instance, like, what are some tips that you and your friends use to make a picture look good? What are some tips that you use with the camera, with other apps uh, to make the picture look nice? Um, do you know, um, do you and your friends rate some, some of the types of pictures and talk about the pictures that you post? Uh, what's a good rating? What's a bad rating? Uh, why? Why is that? Um, how do you feel when you see a picture of yourself or of another person that has been changed to look thinner, to look sexier, to look more attractive? And why do you think that is? So just fostering that kind of um, curiosity with, um, with children so that they start becoming a little more active in their process as well. Um, then we want to start focusing on body focused gratitude. So gratitude involves a warm sense of appreciation for some somebody or something, a sense of goodwill towards that person or thing, and a disposition to act positively that flows from appreciation and goodwill. So increasing amount of literature has been linked to body gratitude practice to lower weight bias internalization, which is a predictive factor for disordered eating. So we also know that it increases body satisfaction and body appreciation. So this is not just like a woohoo, like, yay, let's be grateful for our body it actually helps us develop a better relationship to our body. So body focused gratitude is quite powerful as it helps humanize our bodies, moving our perception of our bodies from objects of attraction or of performance towards being vehicles through which we are able to live and experience life. Um, so again, a lot of research that back up that like body gratitude can be really supportive. So here are a few body gratitude exercises that we can do with our children. So the first one is very simple and it's just asking on a daily basis, if you can, the more that we do it, the more that we practice, the better the result. Um, what are you grateful for about your body today? And we really want to focus on the functionality of our body. So what does our body do for us instead of appearances, right? So this could be our eyes, our, our able, ability to taste, our smell. My favorite one is like the fact that we're able to heal ourselves. Like you cut yourself and you scar, like how cool is it that we can heal ourselves, right? So really focusing on all the little things that our body does. Um, we can also use gratitude prompts. So if they're maybe not used to this and it kind of feels awkward, then we can start using different prompts. Like, okay, I'm grateful for three things that I can hear. What can we hear that we're grateful for, right? Music, um, my favorite TV show, um, or maybe the sounds of birds in the morning. Um, and really going through that list, three things I can see, smell, touch, taste, or three things that my body does for me. So really focusing on like, what is great about our body? We can also do a body scan gratitude. And like this image here, something you can do if your child's a little bit younger, of like going through your whole body and just naming, like, what are we grateful for? Like around our head, like our brain, our ability to think, right? Our ability to imagine, our eyes, our sight. And we really just go through our whole body and just name things that we are grateful for. And typically take for granted when we're not thinking about it. So really doing a whole body scan. Um, and finally, the last thing that we wanted to talk about is parental awareness and modeling. Um, so of course, as we've talked about, cultural environments will shape how we view our bodies as being either good or as being bad. And in the society that we live in, uh, we experience a lot of what we would call weight stigma, which are social stereotypes, misconceptions about people in larger bodies. 
So examples of weight stigma is uh, associating people in larger bodies as being lazy, unintelligent, unsuccessful, lacking self-discipline, lacking self-control, or unhealthy. And what the research shows us is that that's simply not true. Um, however, weight stigma is perpetuated um, in, in the field of, in, in relationship, and sorry, weight stigma is perpetuated in different types of experiences for us and different kinds of uh, environments uh, that can be problematic for us. And so what we find is um, that ourselves as parents, um, having those types of attitudes can definitely have an impact in terms of our children. So what the research is showing us is that some mothers' attitudes towards their own bodies and towards their child bodies can actually promote um, restrictive eating and body dissatisfaction. Whereas parents who model positive body image um, also had children who tended to have less restrictive eating, which is a protective factor for eating disorders. So in, um, in this context, we find it really helpful to become aware and to reflect a lot on your own judgments and attitudes around weight, around food, around bodies, and to assess your, um, how you feel towards people who are in larger bodies and work towards uh, developing more body acceptance. So just a hint also, it's good for your kids, but it can also be good for you. Um, so I added some self-reflection questions that you can have here just to start reflecting a little bit in terms of, okay, well, how, how is this having an impact on me? So we can ask things like, do I make assumptions based on weight regarding a person's character, intelligence, professional success, health status, or lifestyle behaviors? Am I comfortable being around people in all shapes and sizes? What has my relationship with food and with my body been like? What did I need growing up to have a healthy relationship with food and with body that I did not have? And what are some hard but important conversations that I would like to have with my child regarding food and with regarding body? So things to look into. All right, and now we're in the last part of our presentation to talk about when is it time to seek help. So when we've adopted all these skills that you're able to support your, your child with, um, although you may do everything right, again, parents don't cause eating disorders, right? So even if you are there to support your kids as much as you can, sometimes um, all the other layers of the onion show up and take over. So when is it time for us to look for help? Um, so again, going back to this arrow that we have, the best time is when we start seeing disordered eating patterns, right? Like we don't need to wait until we have a diagnosis to seek help. Once we do get a diagnosis, we definitely want to get help. But when we start seeing our child, like when you start noticing that there's a lot of those red flags that we've mentioned earlier, a lot of concerns about food, a lot of concerns about their eating patterns, uh, guilt, anxiousness, shame around food, a lot of concerns about their body, body dissatisfaction, maybe an altered relationship to exercise when all of these things show up um, and you know you feel like maybe it's out of your hands that you're trying to do all the things but your your child is persistent with these concerns then it would be a wonderful time to get connected with a health professional and the reason why is again it's easier to prevent the eating disorder than to treat the eating disorder so this is where we can make a really big impact um, we also want to add a caution that, you know, some of you may have like very, a lot of like, you know, great communication skills with your child and you may be asking them like, hey, how do we feel about food and body? Like, it seems like, you know, things are not as great. And they may tell you like, hey, mom, dad, everything is fine. Life is good. We do want to caution that a lot of people who do have eating disorders also tend to be in denial at first. Um, and this is just part of the eating disorder um, as it presents itself, right? That the way that they eat, the way that they think about food tends to be like, oh no, it's just about health. Like it's fine, I'm fine. So just being aware that your child telling you that they're fine may not actually mean that they're fine if they're on the track of developing an eating disorder. And then also we just wanna make sure um, that weight is not the only sign, right? And like, this is really important. Like both Melissa and I work from a weight inclusive approach, right? So we wanna make sure that we leave you with the message that 
if your child is not underweight or has not lost weight, it does not mean that they're not struggling. Um, they can be at a very normal, healthy weight, the current weight, they can be at a higher weight and the larger body, and they may still suffer with disordered eating and an eating disorder, and they still deserve and require help, even if they're not underweight or medically stable or whatever the case may be. So this is also an important piece of the pie, because again, like Melissa said at the beginning, a lot of people who suffer with eating disorders are actually not in thinner bodies. This is just when I guess of the myth of eating disorders and how we recognize eating disorders, but at all sizes, we can suffer. So we're going to look at the behaviors over just the weight. So just to conclude, um, eating disorders are very prevalent, chronic mental illnesses with high mortality rates and important costs for the person who struggles with the eating disorder, the family members and society. And prevention is really, really key and um, an important way of um, helping. And parents have very important roles to play in preventing and addressing the eating disorders. So we've got a little bit of time. Thank you so much. So we'll um, maybe just take a few moments to answer some questions that you may have um, for us. And uh, here's our contact information as well. And I don't know, in the chat, like, I don't, can you see questions? I think so. I can't see questions, but I saw that somebody had a question that, uh, I found it. 